very much for uh, coming to this talk. Um, I want to talk about a topic that I've heard very little about, um, the second generation of JavaScript technologies and libraries that have arisen over the past years. And I want to maybe first of all talk about what I would mean by the first generation and then introduce you to the second generation. And hopefully you'll learn about some new technologies out there. So um, who I am? Um, my name is Geert Jan. I work for Oracle as a developer, um, in particular on open source projects. So for a long time I've worked on NetBeans. Um, in Apache, I'm the Apache PMC chair for NetBeans. It's an Apache project now. I uh, also work on something else called Oracle Jet, which is a, a front-end uh, toolkit for doing uh, user interface development for your open source. And I've recently written or put together a book of interviews with developer advocates. So it's, a, it's about 780 pages long, interviews with people who are advocates for different technologies and how they ended up being that and what their day looks like and the ethical dilemmas of being a developer advocate. If you would like to review this book, um, let me know and I can get you a free copy for your blog or whatever. Um, it's out there. So to very quickly get to the point, um, JavaScript's been around for a while and one could talk about a first generation of frameworks and libraries having, having been developed at some stage. So first of all, initially we had solutions like jQuery and MooTools and, and Dojo and J, you know, jQuery, these types of um, frameworks and libraries initially. And then maybe a, a second sub-generation here um, with Backbone and Ember and Knockout and AngularJS. And more recently, all the discussion is basically about whether to use Angular or Vue or React. That's basically, in terms of front end, that's the discussion that you hear all the time. Now, um, of course, we know that this massive proliferation of JavaScript libraries and technologies is wonderful on the one side because it shows that there's innovation and there's new ideas and so on. But on the other side, it means um, it's quite quite a big problem to make the right choices. You know, what is the right choice to make? And so you, you spend some time learning Grunt um, for, your, for your builds, and you're very happy with your knowledge of Grunt, and then your colleague tells you, yes, but you should actually be doing Gulp now. So then you spend some time learning Gulp, and you're very comfortable with, with Gulp, and guess what? Brunch is apparently the new Gulp, and in the meantime, there's something else again, and this constant churn is really very specific, very typical to the uh, JavaScript ecosystem, which simply shows that it's, it's a vibrant, constantly developing ecosystem, but um, definitely presents problems if you're creating something more serious. Um, not some hobby project, not some small project, project but something more significant. So the, I would say the, th the three key problems are, first of all, churn. So this, this constant technology change that you have to keep, uh, constantly keep up with. And it's not on the level of that you have to keep up with JavaScript, but it's that you have to keep up with all these technologies, this whole ecosystem around it. And what you then also see developing is the concept of custom stacks. So, of course, if you use Vue, you don't just use Vue. You, you use seven things plus Vue. And if you use React, you use seven things plus React and Angular as well. You know, if you want a component library, these kinds of solutions don't provide them out of the box. So you go somewhere else for the component library. And you go somewhere else for the build system. And as soon as you have a problem, and you go online to Stack Overflow for a solution, it turns out it's a great solution. However, you're not using the two or three things that are specific to the solution on Stack Overflow. You're using a whole different stack. So everyone has their own custom stacks, which, of course, is not ideal. And what you also find is that people are no longer JavaScript developers, but they're Vue developers, or Angular developers, or React developers. I mean, that's crazy. In a few years' time, those technologies won't be there. And you can't be that tightly coupled to these solutions. So, you know, these statements here, for the first time in history, we have people identifying by framework instead of language. And people identifying themselves with a framework is a tragedy. This is what I would like to pose to you. And this becomes even more complicated because over the past years, large enterprises have started using JavaScript as, as a front-end solution. So I come from Oracle, but in IBM, in Microsoft, Google, you know, you can, you can really see how serious JavaScript is by the fact that the large vendors are adopting it, not as an experimental thing or prototyping, but real, creating real serious uh, applications um, for their business using JavaScript, which makes this problem all the more complicated. Because in the enterprise space, it's not about what is cool and what is new. It's about what is stable and reliable and what, what is still going to be maintainable in a few years' time. 
So then you aren't running after the latest hype, but you're running after or trying to find something stable and, and reliable. So why are the enterprises now looking or have been looking over the past years at JavaScript? In particular, because the browser is everywhere. I mean, if there was a competition between platforms, the browser platform is one. It's on all devices. And JavaScript is built natively into it. So it, it makes sense to natively use JavaScript rather than proprietary abstractions that the larger vendors have developed internally, but to use JavaScript directly. And also mobile development. And um, you know, young developers coming straight from colleges and so on know JavaScript. And so their skills have a far closer match with the JavaScript world than some proprietary technology. So Oracle has a bunch of abstractions on top of JavaScript, and, and SAP does, and all of these different organizations do. But it takes some time to learn those things. And plus, when a developer now comes for an interview at an organization, the organization isn't interviewing them, but the, the developer is interviewing the company because there is so much work. As a developer, you can go anywhere. So are you going to go somewhere where there is a free open source technology stack, where your skills that you pick up can be transferred to somewhere else? Or are you going to invest time learning something very proprietary to what that particular vendor is doing? So for that reason, these organizations, simply to be able to attract new developer staff are forced to move into the open source world to create these kinds of solutions, these kinds of stacks that will attract developers. So yes, everyone knows basic JavaScript in one way or another. You know, how deep that knowledge is is, is a different question. But um, the enterprise likes JavaScript, definitely. So for example, um, you know, to, give, to give very simple examples as a starting point, Oracle, SAP, Microsoft are all doing things on the front end with JavaScript. In some cases, Node on the back end, but could be Java, could be whatever. But the front end definitely is um, very big in JavaScript in, in the large vendor space. So what kinds of applications are they creating? So in the case of mobile, I mean, these are logistics, healthcare type applications. But they have very specific requirements that are not common outside the, um, the large vendor space. So for example, the ability to translate strings. So that's a Russian app on the end there. So some localization solution. You don't want every single department in your large vendor figuring out localization themselves. And also, these large vendors have to follow specifications. So the question is, um, you know, keeping up with specifications. It's the question of um, working out a, a solution around localization. It's thinking about accessibility as well. So there's, there's accessibility requirements that just large vendors have to meet. And so all of these kind of um, enterprise level requirements have to be met somehow and aren't met out of the box by these first generation libraries and frameworks. They don't provide these kinds of higher level features, these kinds of enterprise features, including graphs and charts and other components. So it's a real problem. These kinds of very um, you know, interactive, very graphic, very UI oriented applications are typically created a lot in the, in the, in the large vendor space as well, looking like this or a mobile app. So these are all kind of in the logistics, healthcare, finance worlds is where these are used. Now here are some of the typical requirements. So one thing is you find that the people working on these, on these applications at the large vendors are coming from other technologies, from Java or from .NET or from somewhere else. And suddenly, they're using JavaScript for the first time. So this is whole transition to the JavaScript world, meaning that there has to be this low threshold entry point into creating these UIs. They have to be out of the box solutions. You don't want everyone in your organization, or you don't want organizations within your company all figuring out on their own what stack they should be using. There needs to be a standardization, at least across a company. So comprehensiveness, l accessibility, and standards in particular. And in terms of standards, the W3C Web Component Standard for reusability. The other thing you find, which is so um, wonderful and, and, and fun on the one hand, but problematic on the other, is you find a wonderful new library online. You start using it. And you can do the hello world scenario that's in the documentation on the site. And you want to get one step further, and you can't. And then you contact the amazing person who created the library, and they say, yes, I was doing that last week. I'm doing something else now. Hey, it's open source. Why don't you contribute documentation? You know, and, and that's all very nice. But in the enterprise space, it's very problematic, because you want stability and reliability and so on. So aside from these organizations, there's a whole bunch of other ones that might surprise you. Um, so there's these ones. But there's also PayPal, Walmart, Financial Times, Uber, Airbnb. Because nowadays, every organization is an IT organization. 
So if I show you some examples of this, so um, Prekin, ah, you can't see my screen. Midflow, wait, display. Okay, there we go. Great. So, what we see here is something called Kraken.js. And look at the top right, that's PayPal. So PayPal has developed an internal technology stack that they're using, and they've open sourced it, it's on GitHub. Who else is on GitHub? Uber. Uber is, a, is an IT organization, Uber is on GitHub. Their technology stack that they use for their UIs and other parts of their application is online. Airbnb is on GitHub. Um, Walmart is not a shop, it's an IT organization. The Financial Times, not a, new, not a newspaper, it's an IT organization. All these different organizations are IT organizations and many of them have online presences where they make available their technology stack for one reason or another. So this is the, the key tip I want to um, bring across is that a lot of the research in this area, a lot of the standardization in this area within organizations, the, res the result of that is on GitHub. And you can take a look at that. So you've seen some of these. Now here are some characteristics of the second generation. So I call this the second generation, a gathering of the different parts that are available from the first generation and making a comprehensive solution out of it. So first of all, not cool. These are not the latest cutting edge libraries and frameworks and so on, but they're stable, which is much more important in, in this kind of environment. And the other point is, they're not frameworks, but they're toolkits. And the toolkit kind of implies flexibility and modularity, and something that can be extended, because we know the JavaScript ecosystem is changing all the time and new solutions are coming out all the time. So the most important thing um, to think about is the architecture of an application. Since the stack is going to change, to make it as loosely structured as possible, so that you can extend it and, and add and remove from it. And the following of standards, such as the web component specification, such as accessibility guidelines, and so on. But the key questions, so before you rush off to GitHub and you find some random cool stack, key questions, two key questions to ask yourself, first of all is, what does it mean for an organization to put their stack on GitHub? It could mean that we don't care about it anymore. And we're gonna pretend that we care about the community, so we're going to put it on GitHub and say, hey, it's there, and please start using it. Um, it could be, so it could be a sign that the company behind it doesn't care that much about the technology stack. So you need to really evaluate. You can, and you can see that on GitHub. You can see what pull requests are coming in, how the community is operating, who is checking it. I mean, that's the wonderful thing about GitHub. It's all transparent. So that's, that's kind of the, 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 the sort of side effect for these organizations. They can't pretend that, that they're contributing to this, um, because we can all see it, it's all on GitHub, that's really wonderful about it. And secondly, before you pick one of these stacks, think about whether the business that that's, that stack was created for is comparable to the business that, that you're doing. So for example, ING, Big Bank, they have their technology stack on GitHub. You should ask yourself, is my business comparable to what ING is doing? Am I also in the financial world? Or, in, in, if I'm using Uber's solution, is what I'm doing comparable to Uber? So try and map your requirements to what um, these organizations are doing, and based on that, evaluate their stacks. So in the case of Oracle, here is an example. So here is a, this is a completely free open source front end stack. You can see the, the server is empty. It can be anything on the back end, data coming from anywhere, and um, everything is on the client. So it's, it's a pure client solution. Uh, and it's all free open source stuff. So um, Knockout is in there. Is Knockout cool? No, it's not cool, but it's stable. And it's got documentation, and there's lots of things on Stack Overflow. Knockout is in there. Require.js is in there. Is Require.js cool? No, but it's stable. So these kinds of considerations make sense in um, this kind of um, environment. So 
So in Oracle's case, these, kinds, these are the typical libraries, these are the standard libraries that every Oracle front-end application now has. So it makes use of, um, of jQuery, um, which is now um, being replaced by web components, so it's a pure web component-based solution, required JS for modularity um, and knockout, and optionally TypeScript, either TypeScript or JavaScript, Cordova to get it onto the app stores, and um, optionally Webpack. So if we take a look, um, well, we'll take a look uh, at the end. Um, here are the typical enterprise requirements for these large vendors. So stability, proven tool set, that's really critical. Responsive design, you don't want everyone in your organization figuring out um, how to do responsive design. Um, accessibility, internationalization, data visualization, you have concerns about security, about performance, standards. You want to empower business users, so not only a code-oriented technology stack, but also a WYSIWYG solution in the browser. And documentation and support, very important. And in that way, new young developers can be attracted to these kinds of organizations where traditionally they would stay far away from them, especially now um, where you can go anywhere and everyone is working with, um, with these solutions, open source. So the key challenge that I would want to leave you with is maybe stop comparing Angular, React, and Vue. <laughs> Instead, compare Uber, Airbnb, Oracle, Microsoft, find the um, find on GitHub the stacks that close, closest match your requirements. Make sure that they are that they are there, that they are alive and well, and actually being um, being further developed, and that there's a community around it, and so on. Um, and based on that, make those choices. Um, the second point is we need to, I think, educate our community about the pitfalls of being so closely focused on the first generation, because. These organizations, even though, like these large vendors, even though they have taken this second generation approach, they're having a hard time attracting new, new developers anyway. Because in the case of Oracle, for example, their knockout and required JS has adopted for completely valid reasons. But then a developer comes for an interview and says, great, you're doing JavaScript, but I'm a Vue developer, or I'm a React developer, or whatever. So um, I would challenge us to educate our communities that that this is a dangerous approach, and that orientating and identifying yourself that closely with a particular framework or library is, is, is not um, sustainable. So investigate second generation technologies and actively contribute to them as well. Find that stack that is closest to your requirements and actively contribute to it to actually test whether your organization will accept your pull requests and enable you to actually contribute. Um, to put it into a picture, are you focused on hype or on health? Are you using the latest, coolest thing, or are you using things that are stable and reliable and that will still be um, uh, maintainable in a few years' time? That's it. Thank you very much.